Thank you very much for the invitation. Um, it's a pleasure being here. It also gave me an opportunity yesterday to visit one of our clients in, uh, in Tel Aviv. Um, so I'm grateful for that. Um, so what I'm going to cover in this presentation is um, our view of what the issues are in today's data center environment. And, and then we're going to talk about some technologies that we believe are disruptive and believe are discontinuous. And, and then I'll describe you know, IBM's view on those technologies, where we're investing. Um, you know, I can't say future products, but I can say here's the technology areas that we're making investments in um, and, and why, we're, you know, why we're making those investments. Someone had to pay for my travel. <laughs> so I have three product plugs. <laughs> You'll see the three product plugs you know, very explicitly, and I'll say, OK, this page is a product plug. You know, move on to the next page. Um, so I'll start with, you know, this is from Metcalf's um, original paper of Ethernet and with the intention of where Ethernet was, you know, intended and the types of problems it was trying to solve in the campus, which, you know, in the campus environment with switch topologies, you know, this switch topology grew into these, you know, multiple layers, the access layer, aggregation layers, we ended putting up security appliances and such on the campus. And that worked very well on the campus because most of the traffic in the campus um, let's see if this points. Sure does. Most of the traffic in the campus is north-south. Um, and additionally, breaking layer two here and having layer two down to the devices worked very well on the campus. Um, so, you know, no problem. We kind of looked at that tree and we said, this, this tree looks very beautiful. Um, I like this tree. It's a pretty tree. Let's basically take that same tree that we have in the campus environment and let's repot it. Let's repot that tree in the data center. And my focus in, in IBM has been, you know, since, well, it's been 30 years. <laughs> so for my entire career, it's been in the data center. So my focus in this presentation and our, and our focus in networking is in the data center. Um, and when you take this tree and you repot it in the data center, what you find is the fit is not quite as well. There are some, you know, kind of major issues in the data center. Um, Microsoft published a paper in 2010, which, you know, our findings in the data center are very similar to this. And what, what they basically found in that, in that paper is that 75% of service provider environments have east-west traffic within the rack. So 75%, I said that wrong, 75% of the traffic in service provider environments and cloud environments is east-west. So that's a lot of traffic that's going inside the rack that can stay inside the rack, but I'll tell you there's some issues as to why it, today it cannot stay inside, oops, sorry. It cannot stay inside the rack, and that's because most of the service plane appliances up here are sitting up in the physical, in, in, in way up there in the network, and so that east-west traffic that you know, could stay inside the rack has to go all the way up there. And even if the appliance is a virtual appliance, like a, a, a virtual security appliance, you know, pick one from Juniper, from Checkpoint, from IBM, it doesn't matter. You're still going to, the, the reference architectures that the service folks do put the, for example, the SAP server and the database server in different subnets. So you're still going to have to cross subnets in order to go um, east-west. And, and that cross subnet traffic in today's virtual switches, okay, um, has to go east-west because the virtual switch is a layer two switch. It's not a layer three, uh, not a layer three switch. Um, the same is true for enterprise data centers. In that same Microsoft paper, they basically showed that for enterprise data centers, it's like 50, 60 percent of the traffic is east-west. Um, another issue that happened in, in the data center is that Ethernet in the past has not been lossless um, and has not been very well at you know providing very low latency and providing, you know, at the Ethernet level, you know, flow control, congestion management capabilities, bandwidth allocation capabilities. So we invented stuff. You know, in 1998, um, we worked with the industry to come up with InfiniBand. Um, and, you know, we, for several years, <laughs> you know, made this transition from, from parallel SCSI to fiber channel because we needed a fabric, and that fabric needed to be lossless. And, 
And so we ended up having you know, a lossless storage fabric that's you know, in addition to the, to the Ethernet fabric that has to be managed, has to be taken care of. You, know, you have to have people that are certified and trained. And, um, and it also costs a lot of money to, to buy the equipment, the switches. Um, one additional change, you know, difference in the data center is that, that the virtual machines, when virtualization came along, made this layer two, stretched this layer two so that the layer two now had to be multiple racks because you want to be able to migrate virtual machines across these servers. And whatever physical network state exists, you want that state to migrate with the virtual machine. Um, so basically, this is the set of issues that, you know, that we've dealt with in the data center. Um, on, on the network, it's got limited scale from, from all those network types, um, inefficient switching. Um, it's, it's very manual and painful, uh, the virtualization environment uh, to manage, and it's got multiple managers. And you know, in terms of the service plane, and by service plane, I mean firewalls, intrusion prevention systems, load balancers, et cetera, um, you're typically programming you know, point services. Um, you're doing that over and over again. Every time you do a billing system, you have to create the rules for that billing system and, and create them in the, in the network. So what are the technology uh, disruptions that we see? And you know, what discontinuities can, can those disruptions uh, you know, cause? So first, let's define what a discontinuity is. And a discontinuity is um, an instance that you know, you're not mathematically continuous anymore on the function. Um, so what are the examples that we have for, uh, for our network? Um, so two, two, two sets. One is disruptions, discontinuities that are going to happen, in, in my view, to, well, going to happen, are happening to fiber channel now. Um, and I expect it's going to happen to infinite band with 40 gigabit Ethernet, which is now. Okay. When we looked at 40, 40 gigabit Ethernet versus 56 uh, gigabit InfiniBand, the latency at the application level, not at a net pipe level, but at the application transaction level, it's you know nip and tuck between the two of them. It's it's a pretty close uh, set of numbers. Sometimes InfiniBand's ahead, sometimes Ethernet's ahead. So, so we think that this you know these technologies with 10 gigabit, 40 gigabit, 100 gigabit are going to be disruptive to this. Um, I've spent my time, you know, working on these technologies, and um, you know, fortunately, IBM is a very large company, and we have a team in, in Haifa that, since 2009, this team in Haifa uh, was working on this stuff, and it took them about, you know, it took them six months to, you know, whack me in the head and say, Ronald, pay attention to this because there's a change happening here. And we, we think it's very disruptive. And, and so I'll describe, um, they got my attention. Uh, I'll describe you know, why we think this change is disruptive um, on overlay networks. And then the, the, the other you know, change that's happening here that's, that's related to this is open flow. And then I'll describe the stack that basically controls those two things. Okay? And our point of view of you know, how, to, uh, how that control is going to evolve uh, over time. So let's start with, we'll, we'll, we'll go through sustaining uh, and disruptive technologies, and then I'll, I'll, I'll describe why I think Ethernet is, is, a, is a disruptive technology to the other fabrics that are there. Um, so first of all, what's a sustaining technology? This, I'm grabbing this from, I've done this in the past many times, since, since 98, uh, when he first published the paper, um, is, is what's, a, what's a, a sustaining technology? So a sustaining technology is, this are, these are the customer requirements, and you have some high-end you know, requirements here. And a sustaining, require, a sustaining technology basically stays you know, ahead, of that, you know, ahead of that curve. It, it doesn't start somewhere down here and disrupt these markets. A disruptive technology does exactly that. It, it starts you know, very low. It may not look disruptive to these most demanding users. So for example, overlay technology and open flow today may not look very disruptive to a bank. They're very risk averse. And you know, deploying either one of those technologies is gonna take some time. But to a service provider, that might be an easier, you know, that might be an easier use case. It's not so much you know, low end, mid range, high end. It's, it's a different type of you know, market segmentation. 
but it might be you know, usable in that service provider space earlier. And as that technology evolves and improves itself and improves in the enterprise data center space that, yes, this is robust. Yes, it has the HA. Yeah, OK, it's not all the protocol sitting inside the switch. But it works, and it's reliable, and it provides you with the multipathing requirements that you need. Um, we believe it will, it will end up disrupting um, all the market segments over time. Um, an example of, of a technology you know, is, is personal computing technology. And, and, and you can look at personal computing technology processors. Started with calculators. We you know, went into, par in, into PCs, went into organizers, smartphone, tablets. And it's been pretty much a, you know, a, a set of market segments that have been uh, created by, you know, by this technology. So I'll look at the processor trends, and then, and then I'll look at I.O. Uh, we've been keeping track of, of microprocessor trends, uh, AMD, you know, Intel, IBM, used to be more, you know, back, back in time. And I.O. has not, you know, there's been a gap between I.O. And those, and those processor trends. There's kind of a one-time pop that happens here, and that one-time pop that happens here is you're, you're adding more pins, and you may be able to get another one-time pop in the future by adding more pins for I.O. Um, but, you know, once that pop you know, finishes here, you're, you're pretty much back to, you're not closing the gap anymore, you're, 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 you're maintaining that, that, that gap. And this, this example is for a two-socket uh, server case. Now let's take a look at PCI, uh, PCIe and how it, you know, maps to that, uh, to that trend line. Um, and I mapped it all the way out to PCIe Gen 4. Um, and it's, you know, it's keeping up pretty well with the I.O. You know, requirements in the processor. But now if we look at um, if we look at beneath that bus and ultimately at that, well, oh, oh, sorry, ultimately at that bus, um, we think that there's some disruptions underway. Uh, the first disruption, you know, started in 2009 on, on, on SANS and, um, and, 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 and that is fiber channel over Ethernet. And that disruption in, in the 2006 timeframe um, both Brocade and Cisco came to us and said, we've got this great idea. Um, it's called Fiber Channel over Ethernet. And um, we, like, we would like to standardize it. And here's the frame format. Here's the syntax and semantics for it from Brocade. Similar thing from Cisco. And we looked at them and we said, these are completely different. Our customers need, <laughs> want a single standard. Can we please you know, work together? Um, Let's see how I can put it in a nice way that I won't get in trouble by attorneys. Um, I'll put it in a nice, it, I'll put it this way. We, what we ended up doing was HP. I call up my friends at HP. Uh, I called up my friends at EMC, David Black. I called at HP, Mike Krause and Dwight Barron and, and said, we need to standardize this. And we, it needs to be a really true standard, not a, you know, a, 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 a brocade language and a Cisco language. It needs to be one language in this standard. And so we, we met on a regular basis and we, we, we joined that into one, uh, basically created, merged that uh, into, into one standard. Uh, I'm telling you this because when we get to virtualization, we have similar issues in virtualization um, that are going on you know, today. Um, we think InfiniBand, as I said earlier, we've done measurements at the application level. So this is you know, DB2, you know, shared data, right, type measurements. Uh, transactional me measurements of 40 gigabit Ethernet versus 56 gigabit uh, InfiniBand, both with a uh, Mellanox adapter, Rocky for, for, for Ethernet, and, and obviously the InfiniBand adapter for the IB adapter for, uh, you know, for, for IB. And, you know, sometimes the latency is a little bit better. Sometimes it's a little bit worse for Ethernet versus InfiniBand. It's, and it's, you know, the delta isn't any longer a, you know, 10 to 15, 16% delta. It's more like a 2 or 3% delta. And, and that's because the transaction, you know, all the software, the stack, takes a lot of resources. It's not just, uh, you know, how fast the latency is on the switch. 450 nanoseconds versus, you know, 200 nanoseconds. And I don't know, it, it's, it seems to me that something's gonna happen here. Um, something's gonna happen when, when Ethernet you know, reaches this kind of you know, performance. 
And that's something might impact uh, the computer architecture uh, a lot more profoundly, but you know, we'll see. All right, so what are, the, um, what are the disruptive technologies that we see? I'm gonna sort of group these into three, three areas, okay? The first one is the fabric itself, uh, the physical fabric, and how to optimize that physical fabric. And then we'll cover the virtualization layer and sort of two steps in the virtualization layer. Step one is, which we're in the middle of right now, which is automating layer two. You can buy products now that automate layer two so that when you move a virtual machine or you create a virtual machine, layer two state in the network all gets you know, put there in the network. Um, we think the next big step in that um, is, is overlay technology. And it's not so much that it gives you an overlay. That's not the main value. The main value isn't I can do multiple tenants either. In our view, the, the main value of, of the overlay technologies is in the connectivity service. And I'll describe what I mean by the connectivity service uh, in the slides that are coming up. And then the last, the last piece is um, consolidate the management, but also provide this network stack that um, controls these two, uh, these two elements. So, um, so we'll start, sorry, um, for each of these, for each of these three segments, I'm gonna sort of summarize what the requirements are that we hear from, I hear from customers, um, and, then, and then I'll describe the trends, okay? So on, uh, on the optimized fabric, whoops, the optimized fabric, um, we need to be able to have, and, and this is for the most part all there, we need to be able to have um, the ability to allocate bandwidth to, uh, to a traffic class so that storage, for example, can get a chunk of bandwidth allocated to it and guaranteed to it. We need to be able to have flow control. For fiber channel, flow control is enough. Fiber channel has no congestion management. For additional workloads, and, and um, if you really want to get to the point where InfiniBand is, you also need congestion, uh, congestion management. So um, with Ethernet, we have a, it's a beckon scheme. It's a little bit, in my, my opinion, <laughs> it's a little bit of an evolution from, you know, from InfiniBand. Um, it has some enhancements, and that's the, the, the Quantiside, the QCN uh, congestion uh, notification, um, in that it, it takes into account, you know, how much congestion there is along the path back, you know, to the, you know, to the, to, to the source that's creating the, 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 the congestion. Um, we need the fiber channel over Ethernet protocols. Um, there are customers that, you know, it, that's what they want. <laughs> You know, I, I'm pretty much agnostic if, you know, NAS, iSCSI, you know, it's, it's all good. But there are some customers that, you know, I've got my skills in FCOE, I trust FCOE, it's gonna take a long time for FCOE to, to basically, um, I shouldn't say that. Um, it's gonna take some time for, for other technologies to basically displace it completely. Um, and then, and then the last piece is be able to do RDMA, and we think that in addition to RDMA that there's some additional enhancements to RDMA that, that can get, um, that can make RDMA a lot more efficient than it is today. Um, essentially, you know, eliminate a, two steps in the process from the, uh, uh, from the memory transfer across, across processors. So what are, you know, so, so this is the set of requirements is, you know, faster links. We've, we've been through the list of faster links. We've, I just took you through the set of steps on convergence. And then the, 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 the third major requirement area is um, to be able to, su to support multipathing uh, in the fabric. And we have kind of two sets of customers, extremely risk averse guys <laughs> that, um, you know, they don't ever want a disjoint fabric. They're, they want two separate, you know, two separate sets of, uh, essentially the SAN A, SAN B type of mentality, where the switches are completely separated, you know. Um, and by the way, I ask them, well, okay, if, 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 if you, in that scenario, if you have an error, if you, if you have a fault, a software fault on SAN A that got hit because you hit some timing issues because you were scaling and you were really pushing the technology on SAN A, you know, it's the same code you're running on SAM B. It's not like you're running a brocade fabric and a Cisco fabric. You're running the same fabric. So chances are you might get that same timing error on SAM B when you switch up all the traffic to SAM B. 
but there are customers that, you know, for whatever reasons, you know, they, they want two completely separately managed fabrics. Um, for the rest, you know, in my view, we need to have a way of doing disjoint multipath. Whoa, sorry, sorry. We need to have a way of doing disjoint multipathing um, on a single fabric. And um, there are vendors out there that do this today in a proprietary way. Uh, we think it needs to be standardized. And sort of the problem with, you know, with the current stack um, and the current, you know, mechanisms that exist, and, you know, we have some, um, is it takes a long time to get something like this in. As Scott was covering, you know, yesterday, it, it, you, you know, you first have to convince everybody that there's a problem in the IETF. Um, and then you have to put together proposals and then you have to debate, you know, which proposal. And of course, if you started implementing a proposal already, as some vendors have, then now, you know, it's a lot harder to convince them that, you know, proposal A is better even if it is. It doesn't matter. I implemented it. It's in my hardware. So it takes, it takes a while to implement this stuff. So is there a better way um, to providing these fabric services? And, you know, we think that, you know, the alternative here, which, you know, I'm not going to cover in, in a lot of details. Um, you know, Scott's been, you know, one of the founders of, you know, this, this type of an approach. I'll just kind of highlight it and why we think it's, it's, um, it's of interest, is that it might get us a lot faster. Not might. We think it will get us a lot faster, you know, to the end point on these new functions that need to get added because you don't have this long IETF cycle of, you know, trying to standardize you know, do we have a problem? Let's create a framework, an operations manual. Here's the protocol. No, here's three protocols, because why didn't we pick that one? And then finally, the, 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 the solution. Um, uh, so so if, we, if, if we look at some of the other reasons is, is to provide a, you know, in this closed environments where everything comes from event, well, in, in the case of the largest vendors, Everything comes from a single vendor. For the, for the rest of us, we you know we use Merchant Silicon for IBM uh, for for our you know switches, um, and, and we invest in these areas. But for, for the most part, everybody else does. You know the, the larger vendors do all three of those, and they charge a lot. Not not just for the code, but also for features, and they charge for warranties. There is no Linux community you know for this type of environment, and that's where we see you know about the value in OpenFlow is that you can have a cluster of controllers that can use OpenFlow to basically move the control plane, move the control plane into this controller. But more importantly, it's not so much that you can move that control plane, it's that you can do these services, like a multi-pathing service, like a NAT service that basically takes advantage of the fact that OpenFlow can do the actions that you know, Scott highlighted yesterday uh, on, on rules, and based on those actions, provide a NAT service in the device. Um, and therefore eliminate the cost of a NAT service. So you can add, you know, those software, you know, functions in a combination of services here and, you know, data plane functions there um, that overall produce a much lower cost solution than what you have today. Plug one. We have a switch. This is it. <laughs> Supports OpenFlow 1.0. We don't have a controller. We are investing in a controller. Um, uh, we, uh, we view open source as the right answer for that, as opposed to, you know, doing, doing one uh, ourselves. But we, we have partnered with, with these folks on several accounts um, and, and deployed that in, uh, in, uh, in production environments. So let's compare, you know, the traditional way um, of doing this multipathing in the enterprise versus, you know, what I have with OpenFlow. Well, the traditional way scales very well. Um, it's standards-based. It's kind of probably put an equal sign because it's standards-based. But if you really want the good stuff, you got to buy Fabric Path, which is different than Trill. Um, that's what you know. One vendor will tell you. I'm, I'm not saying that. I'm just repeating what some other vendor says. Um, it um, if you want to eliminate all the switches, so you have one switch to manage, like you do with QFabric. Uh, you got to have a proprietary fabric. So you're pretty much saying, I'm betting myself on, you know, this vendor's, you know, type of approach. Um, depending on the type of protocol that you use, your, your convergence times can be quite, you know, can be quite large because you, you have to recalculate the routes. Um, 
And if you've got, you know, uh, link state protocols, then they're not all there yet in terms of the functions that we need in the enterprise. And it's going to take a while to add those functions. The alternative approach is, is, is to use this open flow uh, approach, and, and it scales very well. Um, the multipathing is very, very well because if, if I've got to switch this died, I've, calc I've discovered that topology. Um, I described that at, at ONS, you know, several options for how to dis the, discover that topology and some that we think scale. Um, and, you know, when the switch dies and I detect that failure, uh, you know, in my neighbors, I can pretty much just load one of the alternate paths uh, into all the uh, associated uh, sw uh, switches. Um, oops. I can deliver functions a lot faster, but it does have, you know, two issues. One is, it is going to be gated by this adoption S curve. Um, and in the enterprise space, like I said, a lot of clients are very risk averse. And then the second issue is there's going to be FUD. There's going to be FUD from vendors that, you know, claim to support open flow, but they don't really support open flow. And what they're telling the customer is, you know, you don't, you don't, you don't, you don't want to throw away 20, 30, 40 years of standardization and bet your, you know, entire enterprise on, you know, five research guys from Stanford and Berkeley and, you know, and some coders that, you know, some very good coders that they, that they hired. Um, and so that FUD is, 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 it's there and we got to deal with it. And, and the way to deal with it is prove that it works. Google proved that it worked um, outside the enterprise data center. Um, we need some implementations like that in service provider data centers that we can say here, here's proof cases where it works and, um, and then leverage them. So, summary of this first section is, um, I grabbed a little picture of a penguin from the, from, from the internet here, is what happens when an Antarctic penguin and his, uh, and, and his, and his, and his you know, the wife and, and, and husband go to, to the Arctic and they see a, a networking, uh, traditional networking vendor polar bear. Okay, it's a very dangerous uh, encounter and, and what happens is the Linux penguin, you know, slams this, Slam these two symbols here, wakes up that polar bear, but he better run into, better go into a hole in this, <laughs> in this ice and duck very fast or he's gonna be, gonna be dead meat from that, from that polar bear. Uh, anyway, so this is the trends that we see um, and, and the options that we see for this, you know, for this fat, flat, flat, flat fabric. Um, the next section is gonna be on uh, virtualization. And I'll start this section by saying, if we go back, you know, 10 years in the x86 space, life was very simple for network administrators. The, the IT guys called the network guys and said, I'm buying a new rack of, I don't know, SAP servers. They're going to be doing a catalog system. Whatever you need to do for a catalog system, do it. You, you, you got to buy my firewall resources, more IPS resources, you know, give me some IP addresses. You got to buy more ports on. So do whatever you need to do. They're coming in, you know, next month or they're coming in next week. Um, and the network guy did his job, and that was it. Life was simple. Yeah, once in a while this stuff failed, but you know, it it it, it wasn't as difficult as as it is today. Virtualization changed that because now these virtual machines can all of a sudden come up. The the IT guys, you know, may deploy a new set of virtual machines because they need more resources. They need another billing system or another catalog system. And they may move them around because this server might get overutilized and they may want to then move those resources there. The network didn't respond to that. The network um, pretty much, you know, there was no way of, 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 of associating this, this layer two state that's associated with, a, with, with, with one of these uh, workloads. Um, deploy it on the network and then move it around as that virtual machine moved around. Um, so what are the requirements here, right? So the requirements are automate that layer two state. Um, we, we've done that with QBG. That's the approach that, you know, that, 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 that we took. Um, but it needs to be more than that. Um, and this is the work that, you know, the, the, the HIFA team, in our case, the HIFA team uh, has been doing since 2009. And, and, and that is, we need to also automate all the layer three state. We need to provide an overlay on which we can build a connectivity service that 
all the layer three state, and what I mean by layer three state is any firewall rules that are associated with a workload or IPS rules that are associated with a workload, you know, whatever those are, that moves around with the virtual machine. Um, it needs a scale uh, to support multiple tenants, um, not just for service providers, but a lot of enterprises need multi-tenancy for, you know, the cases of where there's a merger. They're merging, um, two, you know, two companies together, and they don't want to touch the IP address spaces and, and, and MAC address spaces of those, of, of those systems. Uh, it needs to scale across systems, across data centers. It needs to optimize the flows so that when these two virtual machines are talking to each other and they're going through this firewall to do so, I don't have to push all the traffic out to a layer three Okay, and, you know, and bring it back. So our, the first step for us, product plug number two, um, is this, uh, we, picked VM red, we, we picked VMware uh, for our first vSwitch um, that runs the, system, the IBM system network operating system because most of the clients that I talk to run VMware. It's, you know, once in a while I encounter someone with Hyper-V and everybody likes to think KVM and Zen are gonna get there, but in the enterprise, it's, you know, it's mostly VMware. So, um, so based on that, you know, we, we, we implemented, um, the system networking team, you know, implemented the, the, the 5000V uh, switch. It's a, it's a, it, it runs our operating system on VMware, and you know, it, it supports QBG. So all the network state that's associated with this, with, with this web, uh, server here, when that web server moves, all the layer two state moves with that, uh, with that virtual machine. Um, now let's talk about, is that enough? Um, I don't think that's enough. I think more than that is, is needed. That vSwitch needs to support overlay capability. I'll describe why it needs to support overlay capability. Um, every three years, every two and a half to three years, we do a study where we ask clients, 250 clients or so, um, can we instrument your servers and measure CPU utilization, memory capacity, I.O. utilization, network utilization, uh, and, and, and disk capacity? And, and from that, we, we, we basically grab the top um, applications and how many of them are running in a, in a two-socket server. And, and the net of it is that we did it in 2006, we did it in 2010, we're doing it again this, this year, it'll be, it'll be published in the first quarter of next year. So that every 10 years, the number of VMs per two socket server increases 10X. And, and so that means two things, there's a lot more east-west traffic that today has to go all the way out to a layer three if you have a virtual appliance, or it has to go out to a physical appliance if, if, if you're using physical appliances instead. Um, and number two, um, there's a lot of, of, of rules that have to be programmed in the network, the physical network, every time I bring up one of these virtual machines. And if you talk to customers in the enterprise, that's a very manual and expensive and you know, painful process that if you can eliminate, um, there's value there uh, that, that, you know, that can be provided. So our, our, our solution for this, our, well, wrong words, lawyers would kill me. The technology investments that we're making and the approach that we think um, is you know, the right answer for this is, um, is an overlay uh, technology where I provide an overlay in the, uh, in the, in the virtual switch. Um, I control that overlay through an SDN controller. So you know, think um, you've you got a controller for that 5000V you, you know, and, and you've got the 5000V distributed switch. You know, so think that that becomes an overlay switch and this, this controller uh, has this uh, overlay technology added to it. And then I run in this, in this controller um, a connectivity service, which, which I'll describe on the next page, that allows me to automate uh, a virtual system, actually on the next couple of pages. The, the elements of the solution are um, the switch, the virtual switch, um, a gateway, so that you know, for the part of the enterprise where you don't have this overlay technology, or when you you know exit out to a router, you can you know you can pop the overlay out and grab the original packet and send it. Um, we think that the address dissemination mechanism that um, 
was proposed in the IETF, which is a multicast, um, is not going to scale very well. So, you know, our, our opinion is that, that it'd be much better to have an address dissemination service. Think, think a domain, you know, name server for, you know, for this overlay, you know, translation that, um, that you can cluster and allows you to, um, allows you to, uh, to uh, disseminate the addresses. Um, and then finally is a controller. Um, we looked at several options. Oop, let me go one, one slide and then I'll come back. We looked at several options for you know, how to do the, you know, the overlay. Um, we started by thinking we need to support fragmentation. We don't think that's, you know, we talked to the services folks uh, at IBM and several customers and said, no, nah, we, don't, we don't need to do that. The, so the net of it is the VXLAN proposal looked uh, good enough to us. Um, and you know, that's what we, uh, that's what, that's a technology that we're investing in. Um, the, the IBM research team here in, in, in Haifa has been working on this since 2009. You can, you can read, you know, papers from them. Um, everyone will correct me, I'll say in 2008, but anyway, is 2009, uh, time frame for, you know, early 2009 when, uh, I got convinced, um, in February of, of 2011, we described this uh, at, at, at the Ethernet Summit, and you know, Claudio DeSanti, Joe Pellicer, uh, uh Cisco guys came up to me after the, the presentation and basically said, you know, you server guys are all the same. You always want to take network stuff, and you want to put it in servers. And I said, no, you know, Joe, that's not what we're doing. This, you know, this overlay technology is you're, you still have you still have a layer three. It's still running OSPF. It's 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 still going to take advantage of ECMP, but we're making it simpler. You're not you're not managing all of those uh, MAC addresses and providing this connectivity service. And he said, Ah, so he went to dinner after a few wines. He's not convinced. The funny thing is that this year I saw Joe at Ethernet Summit, and I said, Joe, what what happened? <laughs> Last year you said this is the stupidest thing in the world, and in August I saw that you know. The Nexus 1000V is going to support VXLAN in the future. You're investing in this technology. He said, well, Cisco's a big company, you know, got a lot of people, we're investing in everything, you know, so, all right, whatever. Um, so what's the connectivity service? So I'll start with, you know, you start with a workload. This might be, you know, this might be a web uh, server as an example. Um, it, it has some NICs, this, in this example, one NIC. You might have a group of them that are all friendly together, um, that you could load balance between them. Um, you could put them in the same, you know, security plane. They're not going to beat each other up. They're happy little campers, you know, to be happy together. But they don't get along so well with they don't get along so well with others, and so you got to separate them from those others. You you got to separate them with firewalls. You got to separate them with intrusion prevention systems or workload balancers. Um, and from this group of, of elements, you could then create a virtual system, we call it a virtual system pattern, where the virtual system pattern consists of, a, for example, a group of web servers, a couple of database servers, and a firewall and a, and a security appliance, and you configure that pattern once. You configure the firewall rules once, you configure the IPS rules once, and then you're, you're done. You don't have to do it every time you deploy a billing service or a catalog service or you know, an ordering service, wherever the service is. You now just take that pattern and you, de and you deploy an instance of that pattern. And all of those rules you know, get deployed. Um, this is what we think is needed. And it needs to deliver this is not just to deliver an overlay switch. That's nice. That's a nice element. But that's not it. <laughs> you need to provide the service. You need to, you need to work with companies that do security you need to have the ecosystem there so that the ecosystem can do those, you know, configurations and, and work on these patterns. If you do this type of approach, we think it, the simplification is I don't now need to configure all this stuff manually. I can now configure it one time and deploy it over and over again. I'm kind of running short on time, so I'm going to go through these slides a little fast. Number two, I don't have to go all the way out to a layer three if I have a virtual security appliance because now this is a layer three overlay and I can do that traffic inside inside the server. So I've optimized the server traffic. So these are the trends that we see. Uh, we think this is very disruptive. This is where we are today. Uh, these are the technologies that, that we think um, 
are going to make a major disruption in the, in the industry. And like I said, it's not just the overlay, it's, it's the service. All right, the last element is, is the network integration. And the network integration requirements are first integrate the network management, but then also provide the stack where the stack has drivers, I'll call them that, for overlays. It's got drivers for uh, OpenFlow. It provides open APIs for these services to connect to where the service might be a, a multi-pathing service, uh, a connectivity service, uh, and you might envision some additional service, a, a fiber channel forwarder service, service et cetera. Um, we're delivering the, that virtual system pattern today on, on this system. <laughs> oh, well. Um, should call it by the product name, but um, sorry about that. Uh, we're delivering it on, on these systems, um, and the system uh, today does not include the security appliances, the firewall, the, you know, the IPS. Th that's uh, the investments that, that we're making in this uh, software-defined network uh, uh, stack. So this is, you know, this is what, what's available now. Um, this is you know, technology investments that we see as critical to provide a complete solution that includes the, you know, the firewall services and, and other service plane services. Um, this is the last slide. It's basically a summary of, of um, the technologies that we think um, are disruptive in the enterprise, which ones are there now, and um, which ones are emerging. Um, and I think I ran a little bit over, but thank you very much. <laughs>